I'm done discussing or debating flat earthers, and I'll tell you why. I used to be part of a weekly radio podcast alongside paleontologist Rachel Nannan Brown. In one episode, she and I had a mock debate wherein I pretended to be a creationist, Reverend Ernest Poe, a character I've done a few times now. As that character, I beat Rachel easily, not because I'm a good debater, but because it's so easy to seemingly discredit all of science by ridiculing what you don't understand. So all I had to do was pretend that I didn't understand anything and interrupt her with absurdities, using the fallacy of reductio ad absurdum to make fun of her for believing what an ignorant person would mischaracterize as ridiculous. It's easy to play stupid, and if you really are stupid, then this behavior would come naturally, which is why so many pseudoscience apologists are so much better at that game than I am. It's especially easy to criticize things from a position of immunity, too, where you don't even have an alternate explanation. You're just trying to attack the one that the smart people figured out. And religious extremists like creationists think that if you disprove science, or if there's anything that science somehow can't explain or that you don't know the explanation for, that somehow disproves God, as if the default position is, I don't know, therefore it must be magic. Now, magic by which I mean supernatural miracles, is not an explanation of anything. It's only an excuse some people use when they don't have an explanation. But believers think that God magic is a valid answer for everything that science doesn't already account for. If you can't figure out where everything comes from, just say that God said abracadabra and spoke everything into being. But people who like to pretend that the earth is flat have a bigger problem in that if they can't understand Newton's laws of motion or anything else Newton figured out, that does not mean that the Earth is flat. There has to be some data to indicate that it's flat. And importantly, there has to be some alternate explanation for how all of that works. For example, you can't just say that the sun and moon are both made of magic and that's how they float in the sky, although some flat earthers have tried to argue that. Because remember, that means that we're not just arguing for magic. That means that they're trying to make a scientific claim and they have to provide support for that claim. Did you hear about the Wisconsin pharmacist who admittedly de deliberately destroyed hundreds of coronavirus vaccines just to deprive people in need of them? How is it that that guy is a pharmacist and an anti-vaxxer at the same time? He's also a flat earther who doesn't believe that the sky is real. So if the sky isn't real, what is it? And that's another problem. Flat earthers can't agree on what their position is. Some say that the earth doesn't have a discernible shape because it's, and it's an infinite plane in two dimensions. I heard one guy describe the earth as a bowl in which he said that the, the atmosphere has a parabolic lens effect, making the tiny compressed sky look much bigger than it is. Other flat earthers say that we live in a disk world that is constantly accelerating upward at the rate of 1G per second since the beginning of time. Never mind that the Earth must be going warp factor 9 by now. We'd be going faster than speed of light even if the Earth was created only last year. Yet the flurfers complain that they can't feel the speed of the Earth's rotation around the sun, which of course you can't because everything is moving together. The most common concept of the flat Earth is the one that is supported by the Bible where the Earth is spread out like a map over a flat disk, not a sphere, dur, but a circle, shug, divided into four quadrants, sometimes mistranslated as corners. And this disk world stood on pillars like a table so that it would not move. And all of this was submerged in a watery abyss under a uh, covered by a giant transparent crystal dome that looks like molten glass, but is solid, like a snow globe. The sun, the moon, and the stars and the stars are something different than the sun, according to the Bible, because the Bible, you know, people who wrote the Bible didn't know any different. Uh, these were all supposed to be contained within that expanse of this massive dome. And fountains would allow water in from below the foundations of the earth, which, you know, the earth doesn't have foundations, but we'll skip that for a moment. And windows in the expanse of this firmament would allow rain in from the top also, because the Bible says that our snow globe is, is in a vast oceanic abyss where there is water above and below this supposed firmament. The Bible also says that the stars are made to sit in the or stand in the span of this expanse, but we know that you know they, they are not high in the firmament because there is no firmament, and also the stars are so far beyond our puny world that you know, they are much too far away for, for height to have any meaning anymore, and, and they can't be blown out of place by any storm. 
and they can't be taken down by anything at all. And we've also proven that, you know, that the elusive heavenly firmament has no, uh, no foundations and neither does the earth. There are no pillars holding the earth above the deep because there is no deep. Outer space is not full of water. But that is the depiction that most flat earthers prefer, and they usually cite the, solar, the polar projection map to illustrate it. But flat earthers don't cling too tightly to reality because they know that that map doesn't work and that they can't defend it. We can disprove that map in a matter of minutes without even performing any experiments. Just get on a travel site as if you're going to book a flight from Johannesburg to Sydney or between any two locations in the Southern Hemisphere because that's where distances are getting shor shorter where the flurfers insist they should be getting much, much wider. And it doesn't matter to irrational people how easily we can disprove their position. They will ignore everything that proves them wrong. I already had a discussion with a flat earther who personally disproved his own hypothesis during the filming of a, filming of a documentary of flat earth believers. He tried an experiment designed to prove that there was no curvature to the earth, but he accidentally revealed that there is one. So he simply ignored that as if it didn't just happen. I talked to another, you know, a couple of other flat earthers too. The first time I tried to reason with one of these people, I, I thought that guy was just the most profoundly ignorant person that even I have ever talked to. But that wasn't his only problem. Uh, when you're going to talk about you know evidence for things, part of the evidence is you have to have a model. You have to have some kind of explanation for the for certain aspects. And other flat earthers are, are doubtless going to be filling you in information. I want you to be prepared when you come back uh, that you could not account for the existence of gravity as an explanation of weight. You couldn't, you couldn't account for the existence of weight. What, what causes weight in your model? Uh, you couldn't account for the observations of Aristosthenes or Kepler because Aristosthenes verified that the, that the world was round around the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Kepler realized the motions of the planets only made sense in a heliocentric model. Uh, you couldn't account for the Aurora, but the that's Aurora the... Borealis compared to the Aurora Australis. This is something you need to be prepared for for next time. You couldn't account for uh, Saturn, Miranda, Neptune, or any other world that we talked about. And, you'll, and, you'll, you, and when you watch this video again, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, you couldn't account for the equator versus polar conditions okay. at both poles. Why would it be both poles on, on a flat Earth map? Uh, I would like you to present an action. If, if, if the polar projection that I showed or that I used is not the accurate map, please provide the accurate map when you come back the next time. Thank you. You could not account for the flight patterns that we talked about, and these only get worse as we continue. And I think it's uh, worse. <laughs> yes, and, and you could not account for the difference uh, between flight and swimming, because if a bird can lift itself aloft in the air, that's mm -hmm. really not any different than using fins to lift yourself aloft in the water. It's just right. So that's my thing. So is gravi gravity intelligent enough to know the difference between a bird and a fish? We, we can get into that. His claim was that Antarctica is not a continent. He said that it is actually a ring around the world that both keeps the oceans from spilling off of the pizza planet and also that it is the foundation for this fictitious firmament. He said there's a vast armada of warships from multiple countries guarding Antarctica so that no one can get there and discover the truth. Because, you know, there's always a vast conspiracy of powerful few who hold all the secrets they don't want you to know for reasons that make absolutely no sense. And this guy's argument didn't even change when I showed him that we can go to Antarctica. I've personally known a half a dozen people who have been there. We can book tours online. And what, what shook him was when I said that we could go to Antarctica and then fly around the continent until we came back to the original point whence we left. I think some jets have the fuel capacity to circumnavigate a relatively small continent like that. But we would not be able to do that if he was right about Antarctica being a ring around the whole wide world. This guy seemed to think that I'm super rich and that I was going to fly him to Antarctica in my private plane and then force him to fly around the continent with me just to force him to renounce his precious belief. And that's what he made it clear that that belief meant more to him than whatever the truth is, because he likes to pretend that the earth is flat and he does not want that belief to be disproved. And that tends to be the case for a lot of other religious believers, too. 
I, I talked to that Matt, that guy, Mad Mike, who built a rocket to reach high enough into the upper strap, upper atmosphere to prove that the Earth has no curvature. He told me that he built that rocket because he didn't believe in science. I told him that science is testable, demonstrable, verifiable, and that he was proving science by building a rocket and flying it in himself. He didn't aim very high. He, Mad Mike didn't understand Newton's third law of motion, that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. He didn't think that rockets could fly in space because he thought they would have to have air to push against. He ultimately killed himself in that rocket, and he never got as high as I was in the observation deck of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Seriously, an elevator went higher than that guy's rocket. So past experience has already shown that flat earthers want to be immune. They don't want to defend the claims that they're making, and they can never admit when they're wrong. They just want to criticize what they don't understand, which any dummy can do even better than smart people can. And flat earthers cannot present an alternate model. They've tried that, and it didn't work. They can't explain what they won't understand, and they don't want to defend anything that they know they can't back up. They want to believe that the Earth is flat because science can't explain a flat Earth. That's why they can't up, come up with a model, and that's why they think it's proof of God. They can't think scientifically or hypothetically. That's why they either won't perform any tests or they ignore every time they're, every test that, they're, that they fail. They think that anything science can't explain is proof of God magic. They pretend to be scientific, but they believe on faith, and they have to create the illusion of false equivalence by pretending that rational people believe in a spherical earth by faith too, as if our evidence-based understanding is a religion, which of course it's not, and they know it's not. The rejection of and objection to religion is not a religion itself, but irrational arguments are all about projecting one's own faults onto others. It's a version of the two quo qui fallacy that I call the pot calling the silverware black. If you don't have a valid scientific argument, but you're in a scientific debate, then all you can do is quote mine or simply insult your opponent. So modern day debate asked me to take on one last flat earther. Uh, I think he's the like the leader of the flat earth society or one of their most prominent speakers. And that debate went exactly as everyone predicted that it would. I, I'm confident this can be civil, and so thanks so much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. I would have thought it would be confident that it would be civil too, except that he opened up by insulting me. Uh, Aaron, I'm sorry you felt insulted. I just said you were going to lose the debate, and so far your opening was a bunch of gish galloping and rhetoric about how the Earth can't be a globe. We know it's or Earth can't be flat. We know it's a globe for a thousand of years because of sticks and shadows. Now, you are familiar with Neil uh, Jackson. And, and photographs from space and moonwalking well, and, 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 and a space station currently in orbit around the planet. But you just ignore everything. We just, all the proofs that we anything. can give can we you. we go over all these one by one, Aaron, before you get triggered, please? I know, take a drink. Get I've been warned. I've been warned that you were going to try to, uh, to enrage me, that you were that type. So, but don't worry, I've, I've dealt with your type many times. I agreed to do that debate only on the condition that my opponent provide a model and a map and that we would talk about those, which is the minimum requirement of any opponent who pretends to have scientific evidence on his side. You better bring it, present it, and let us test it to prove it. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Big Bang cosmology. And just because I don't like it doesn't mean that I won't admit that it is a valid theory and supported by evidence. And it may well be true. Still, I'd love to disprove it. But I know that the only way to do that is to provide an even better theory, uh, one that accounts for all the same data that this one does and more by providing more and more fulfilling and more profound predictions. You can't replace something that works with nothing that doesn't. If my opponent is just going to pretend that the moon landings and SpaceX and all our telecommunication satellites and all our historic experiments and discoveries and accomplishments, landing probes on Mars and Venus and a couple of comets as well, and all our observations of the International Space Station and from hypersonic aircraft and all of that are just a part of some impossibly huge and cohesive centuries-old conspiracy of hundreds of years at least, but without any leaks from anyone ever. If he's just going to deny reality entirely, then there's no point in even having a debate. He has to have some accountability too, being bound to the same reality as the rest of us. He has to present an opposing position and defend it so that the rules are the same for both of us. 
That means that he has to have a model and he has to, under, he has to understand his model well enough to defend it, not just against me, but against the entire scientific community too. So this debate, if we can call it that, lasted a few minutes, only a few minutes beyond our, own, our opening arguments, when my opponent revealed that he had lied about having and meeting the criteria that I required. I, the reason I asked for the map is because I'm going to use the map against him. I don't have a and, map. And he can't, yes, you do. You gave it to me. I asked you to uh, forward okay. me two things. Whoa. The model, which you couldn't cough up because there isn't one. There would be if your shit was real, but it isn't, so you can't get a model. And the other one was a map. And you did give me some Instagram thing, which included the map. So you're using a polar projection map. You're not. You, you, so, so you gave me neither a model nor a map. Okay, you meet neither of the criteria. Draw Manning a model. Oh, you're going to leave? James, I, I set up the criteria that he had to produce to, both. You're going to leave? He had to produce a model and a map. And I said that if he failed to produce either one of them, Why are you then he here? would not meet the criteria. Why are so you now here? he's saying that he, I, I was going to allow, here? I was going to allow that I can get him to describe his model using his map. He won't do that. Now he's telling me that he won't even, he won't even side with the map he sent me. I ask for a map 90 minutes later. I kid you not. No map. No, he's got nothing. He meets the, he failed the and minimum nothing. criteria. I agreed I would not come on this show unless he produced both. He's produced neither. I'm gone. I have nothing. I have You have nothing. Arguments. That's correct. If I you have don't have a model argument. that shows predictions that man. you can verify, then you've got butt it's kiss. A nothing. Policy. It's a reification policy. Look how triggered you are. No. Why can't we talk about science, Aaron? Why can't we talk so, about empirical epsilon? I can, no, but I'm not, I, I've, I've made this arrangement with James. I, right. I put Hold minimum on criteria second. on here. Do we... This jackass failed both. Do we, uh, do, uh, Nathan, would it be fair? Would you concede that you don't have those things or, or would you I've actually argue told you him do? I don't subscribe to a model. He does. Yep. I'm I out. In the very few minutes that we interacted, my opponent said some very stupid things and I'd like to take this opportunity to address them. I want to stay on the first topic, James. He asked me why the moon doesn't fall towards Earth. Now he's talking about my map, okay? Okay. I don't want to talk about we'll the map. We'll do that one first. Till I cover his first question. Aaron, the sun and the moon are locked in the firmament. They would not be falling towards Earth. They're not physical objects, and their gravity is not real. Hot air balloons and helium balloons go up, Aaron. So what now? Can I so, answer So you're saying the moon now, is, the moon is I, not real? No, I did not say the moon is fake, Aaron. You got to. You said it's. You said it's back. not a physical object. Pull the hair back, okay? So you said it's not a physical real. object. Things can What be does that real. mean to you? And that doesn't necessitate that it has to be a physical object, okay? Now is gas? Well, it's an imaginary object then, if it's not physical. No, it's not imaginary, okay? What's Just the option? Just, will you agree that solids? It's either made of matter and energy, or it's made of imagination. Which one is it? Well, is plasma a thing? Yeah, it's matter. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. So you so have is plasma, it a is the moon a physical thing or is it know. an imaginary thing? I don't thing? have claims about what the moon is. You do, Aaron. I'm asking you. How does asking I, you a I question a claim? I heard you, Aaron. And I told you. Then why you don't you give me an answer? About what the moon is, you do. You said the moon is not a physical thing and neither is the sun. No, I said you're going to assume it. I said No, I'm it. asking you the question. That means I don't assume. I don't straw man okay, either. Great. Because I, I ask know. questions, and then I listen I to you fail to answer them. Can you ask me again what the moon is? Exactly. What is the moon? You said it's not physical. Are you ready to recant that and decide time, that it is physical? Aaron, you got to stop talking if you're going to ask me what the moon is. So for the fourth time, Aaron, take a big gulp. I don't know what the moon is. You assert it's a physical object in space vacuum. Note that he asked whether gas or plasma are physical, as if he didn't know. Well, is plasma a thing? Yeah, it's matter. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. He didn't know that. Uh, some of you may have heard me explain that the reason that people believe that they have a soul is because back when the stories in the Bible were being written, people didn't yet know that air was particulate matter. So they thought that the movement of air was somehow spiritual, supernatural, and the, there's a lot of scriptural references to prove that. And this guy seems to be confused by that same impression. Note also that he said, The sun and the moon are locked in the firmament. 
They would not be falling towards Earth. They're not physical objects. There is no firmament. But even if there was, there'd be no way to lock the sun and the moon into it. Even if we pretend that they're both really tiny, like he imagines them to be. If they could be locked in, they would have to be physical. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But it gets even worse because then he said this. And their gravity is not real. Hot air balloons and helium balloons go up, Aaron. He says that as if I didn't know that hot air balloons and helium as well as hydrogen balloons all go up. He says that as if each of these things contradict the theory of gravity, because elsewhere he clarified. Yes, that means there's no gravity. It's idea. So they say an idea is causing the entire universe to things to fall down. So again, he's arguing for magic, that things fall down because of divine telekinesis. So why do balloons go up? Somehow he doesn't understand why hot air rises, because air is made of a mixture of mostly nitrogen and paired oxygen molecules, as well as carbon dioxide and trace amounts of a few other gases. Heat expands these molecules so that they're less dense, causing them to shift, so that the, the warmer, less dense molecules float on top of the colder, denser molecules. Gravity! Have you ever heard of fucking gravity? Now, why do helium balloons and hydrogen balloons go up? because these are the two lightest elements on the periodic table. Oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are all much heavier, in, even in gaseous form, even when they're not part of larger molecules. So hydrogen and helium will always be pushed upward by the weight and pressure of these hev heavier elements with so much more atomic mass. Gravity! Like if you had a silo full of popped popcorn and you set a five pound railroad ball bearing on top of that, it's going to plunge through all of that popcorn to the bottom. Even if you cap that stack, that tower of popcorn with 50 pounds of regular automotive size ball bearings, if there's any movement like a minor earthquake or something like that, then all those ball bearings are going to find their way to the bottom so that the popped popcorn is going to be floating on top of them. And that's why, that's what happens when hydrogen and helium float on the rest of the air. They don't contradict gravity, they demonstrate it. Gravity! Is the moon a physical thing or is it an know. imaginary thing? I don't thing? have claims about what the moon is. You do, Aaron. No, that's a lie. He does have claims about what the moon is. One, that it's not a physical thing, implying that it's a supernatural thing. And two, that it's locked in a physical, albeit fictitious, firmament. And as he said in another video, Yeah, 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 I don't believe people landing on the moon. I don't think it's physical and you can walk on it. I think it's a light in the roof. Eclipses, both solar and lunar, prove that the moon is not a light. And with current technology, even cheap telescopes that anyone can buy can prove with first-hand observation that the moon is definitely physical, being bombarded with all these physical objects that leave all these nice craters all over the place. If there are craters, that means it can be affected by physical objects, and that means that the moon is a physical object itself. I think I've already debated the best that the flat earthers have to offer. It, it, at least what, that's what I was told by people promoting this particular liar. Yet all of his arguments amount to nothing but willful ignorance and absolute idiocy. With really dumb claims that really need to be addressed. So rather than the unproductive confrontation of his preferred debate style, where he thinks that victory is achieved by the arrogance of ignorance and, and merely by pissing off your opponent, I'm going to address his arguments here, beginning with this one. All right, folks, I got a debate with this gentleman on the left here, Aaron Raw, on Friday night, and I'm just doing some research. His debate with Jaron was terrible. He used a bottom-up fallacy where he assumed things only disappear bottom-up on a globe. And he doesn't understand that's how things disappear bottom up on a flat earth also. They wouldn't, actually. You know, the, the Quran talks about the Barak, which is a, some sort of equine animal with wings that carried Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem and, and then from Jerusalem to heaven and then heaven back to Jerusalem and then back to Mecca all in one night. I, it's like something out of the movie Yellow Submarine because the way this animal moved so fast was by stretching its feet out to the horizon, it would stretch its first foot out to the horizon, and that's its first step, and then move forward in one step, and now it stretches its other foot out to the other horizon with the second step. So it, it's interesting that these medieval Arabs understood that there are new horizons, even though some of them still today believe that the earth is flat. He straw man a model like 10 times. 
Straw man is when you misrepresent someone else's argument by distorting it into something else, making it weaker and thus easier to attack. But I cannot straw man a model if he never had a model to begin with. I've you already argue told him, do. I don't subscribe to a model. He does. So for him to say that I straw manned his model means that I distorted what his model says. He can't even make that accusation without telling us what his model actually says, which, of course, he refused to do and lied about in order to trick me into debating him. He said we placed mirror reflectors on the moon when they were getting ping times from the moon prior to landing on the moon. No, I said that astronauts landed on the moon and placed reflectors there while they were there so that later they could use lasers to get ping times. He said we would see the sun all day. He doesn't understand sunsets and sunrises on a flat earth. No, I definitely do understand sunrises and sunsets on a flat earth better than he does because he doesn't understand that. And what he believes happens requires curvature. What is night and day? If you try to place a luminous object like the sun above a plane like the flat earth, how does light reach half the plane and not the other half? Say you come up with a mechanism whereby light dissipates appropriately. How does this then fit with other observations? He's a perspective denier. He also denies Coriolis. He says that the atmosphere moves with the Earth. So he thinks that if I think that the atmosphere moves with the Earth, that means I'm a Coriolis denier? Let's talk about that. But first, let's get some clarification to make sure that I don't straw man his model, the model he doesn't have or has except when he needs one. We need to educate them on the globe Earth and the flat Earth, guys. I can't tell you what's wrong with it. You just got to see it for yourself. First question I want to pose to you guys is, does the Earth spin 1,040 miles an hour? Does anyone in here, by a show of hands, think the Earth spins 1,040 miles an hour and is brave enough to raise a hand? All right, cool. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you a question later because you were brave enough to raise your hand. So how would a spinning Earth affect our atmosphere, guys? I have a question for the gentleman who raised his hand. Would it cause it to rotate as one cohesive body, or would the Earth work as a giant blender? What do you think? See, this is what I, oh, let me repeat. Does the atmosphere move with the Earth, or does the Earth blend the atmosphere, and the atmosphere moves separately from the Earth? The atmosphere moves with the Earth. Excellent. So, let's look at both of them real quick. If the atmosphere moves with the Earth, with my man, uh, that's not what mainstream science teaches at all. They teach that Earth has a Coriolis effect and that the atmosphere moves separately from the Earth. Not quite, no. This is what mainstream science actually teaches. Picture a circle. Here's its center, here's point A, and here's point B. Point A is twice the distance from the center of the circle than point B. Oh yeah, and it spins from its center. In two seconds, both points do one full revolution. But to go all the way around, point A has to go this far, while point B only has to go this far. And we all know if something travels a greater distance in a shorter amount of time, it must be going faster. So point A must be moving faster than point B. Okay, now swap out this flat circle for the Earth, and the same thing is true. All points closer to the center, say like someone in Greenland, will be spinning slower when compared to points spinning further away from it, say like people in Brazil, closer to the equator. So if we look at it all flattened out, we can picture something like this. Arrows at the equator travel faster than arrows at the 45 degree line like we just observed. Now imagine you're a cloud that formed here on the equator. You'll have the same velocity as the Earth, but then a gust of wind sweeps you to the north where the Earth isn't spinning as fast. Due to inertia, your speed remains the same. You don't get any faster, but everything around you is literally traveling slower, so you, relative to the ground, move ahead of everything else. If you're a cloud that forms at the 45 degree line, you'll also have the same speed as everything around you, but if you drift down to the equator, you'll be moving slower than the ground underneath you, so you'll fall behind. And the same things for the southern hemisphere. Moving towards the equator always results in falling behind, while moving away results in pushing ahead. Okay, now imagine a low pressure cell. That means all the air around Around it will get sucked into the center, but the air coming from the equator will be traveling faster so it will deflect to the right, while the air coming from the poles will be moving slower so they'll fall behind and deflect to the left. What this results in is a circular air current spinning counterclockwise, and that's exactly what hurricanes are, low pressure cells spinning because of the Coriolis effect. 
Moving this example down to the southern hemisphere, things are reversed. A low pressure cell will still suck in the surrounding air, but now the air coming from above will be moving faster, again deflecting to the right, while the air coming from below is moving slower, again falling behind by moving to the left. This results in a clockwise spin, which is why storms in the southern hemisphere spin this way. Uh, and that's about it. So as you can see, the Coriolis effect occurs because the atmosphere is moving with the Earth, just like I said, and because the Earth is curved. Check out Neil deGrasse Tyson's Twitter. He talks about field goals being made because of the rotation of the Earth moving separately from the atmosphere. So if you have a north-south stadium, and many are, if it's oriented that way, and the kicker kicks the ball, depending on how high and how long it's in the air, the rotation of the Earth can have a significant effect on its trajectory towards the goalpost. If you're trying to make a 50-yard field goal, that's far away enough, and the ball is airborne long enough for the rotation of the Earth to deflect it to the right by a third of an inch. Cincinnati Bengals against, I forgot who was it, uh, Seattle Seahawks in overtime, sudden death kick, and the kick went up and everybody's heart stops and no one breathes, and there it tumbles, and it hit the left upright and went in for the win, but kind of barely went in. And then I tweeted, I said, this game was one assisted by the rotation of the Earth. And that force that makes that happen is the same force that sends hurricanes rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. What Neil is talking about isn't quite the blender effect that the flat earther makes it out to be because it only affects a football that has been in the air for 50 yards or so by one centimeter. Airplanes experience the same thing, and the corrections for it are so subtle that the pilots don't even notice they're making it. You don't notice that you're just making a slight turn over a long period of time, you know? Okay, the atmosphere, this is what mainstream science doesn't even say happens, but I just want to cover it because it was Aaron's position earlier. If the atmosphere moves with the Earth, that would necessitate that the atmosphere goes faster and faster the more you increase in altitude. Now, great, there is no force that would cause things to increase in velocity as they increase in altitude. Yes, there is. That force is called centripetal force, which is a net force working in conjunction with gravity, which is another force that flat Earth believers try to deny because he's asserting that it's a hot air balloon or a helicopter or a drone, an insect, smoke from a volcano. As it goes up in the air, it's traveling faster and faster to maintain its tangential vector above the Earth. Now, that is crazy because that's not how fluid dynamics work. Yeah, that is exactly how fluid dynamics work. And it's also part of the explanation for how birds and flying insects manage to inhabit islands like Hawaii that are thousands of miles away from other continents. The Flat Earth Believer forgot all about spaceships and meteors burning up on re-entry because the Flatards pretend that there are no spaceships and that the upper atmosphere isn't moving that fast anyway or that it's not moving at all. Instead, they pretend that... The blender effect, which is what his religion teaches. We have an atmospheric blender. There would be a, a drag in the atmosphere. Things would move separately from the surface of the Earth. Except that there would be no drag because space is a relative vacuum. So you have the topography of the Earth, mountains and trees and so on, keeping the atmosphere moving along with it, except for minor deviations like differential hotspots generating a slight amount of wind. But on the other side, the outside, on the upper layer of the atmosphere, there's nothing. No topography, no source of friction to drag against, nothing to slow anything down. And even at 1,040 miles an hour at the equator, the stratosphere still isn't going fast enough to achieve escape velocity because this is a matter of math and science and flat hards don't do either one. So this is what I mean when I say Globers don't know their own religion. Every religion is a faith-based belief system positing the notion that a supernatural essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical body to continue on in some other form. Obviously, our understanding of geosphericity and heliocentricity have nothing whatsoever to do with souls or any other aspect of religion, where flat earth belief definitely does. Flat earthers are, for the most part, creationists. They're just more extreme, denying even more of reality than other creationists do, rejecting not just evolution, but a lot more science than just that. I just feel like I have an obligation to tell people, you don't really want a spinning ball. I've been telling them for years, you didn't come from monkeys. Well, if we didn't come from monkeys, then why are we still monkeys?
Careless Linnaeus, a pre-Darwinian creationist who was the first to classify all of life, was confused and dismayed at the fact that humans were indistinguishable from apes. According to both diagnostic morphological traits and genomic orthologs, humans belong to the taxonomic suborder Anthropoidea, also known as semiaforms, which is the clade of monkeys, and cladistically, we are still monkeys right now. I'll put links below to explain that in more detail. But suffice to say that we are animals because we are multicellular eukaryotes with an internal digestive tract, and that's what an animal is. What kind of animals are we? Well, we all accept that we're mammals, right? Warm-blooded animals and are born in an amniotic fluid that have hair and mammary glands to produce milk. That describes our species, too. Similarly, if you describe all diagnostic features of primates as contrasted with other mammals, you describe people, you know, opposable thumbs and all of that. If you describe monkeys, semiaforms, as contrasted with other primates, you describe people too. If you list the traits of old world primates, catarines, as contrasted with new world primates, platyrines, you describe people again. If you narrow your list to traits that are, that are shared by apes in the taxonomic family Hominoidea, as contrasted with those surviving old world monkeys, Circopithecoidea, and remembering the fossil group, Pro Propliopithecoidea too, you describe people again. And if you narrow it even further to list the traits of great apes, hominidae, as contrasted with lesser apes, hylobatidae, you describe people again, meaning that humans are a subset of apes, which are a subset of monkeys, which are a subset of primates, which are a subset of mammals, to put that as simply as I possibly can. But flat earthers don't just deny science. They necessarily deny quite a lot of history, too. Did you know they made up dinosaurs? True. People in the school system. I know that's not true. Sir Richard Owen was a British paleontologist who established the Natural History Museum in London. And curiously, he, also, he was also a creationist, though not the sort that we have today. He was also the world's leading authority on paleontology, studying a group of fossil species that had been brought to him. And he classified them together as dinosaurs, by which he meant fearfully great lizards. But different from lizards in that their legs were like columns supporting their body weight directly from beneath the body, like, you know, the way the mammal's legs are, as opposed to the splayed position of lizards and crocodiles. Now, that was the first diagnostic feature of dinosauria. The fossils that Owen studied and named are still on display in the Natural History Museum to this day. I've been there myself a few times, and I've seen each of them. You can too. So they're not made up. And Owen himself had nothing to do with the American school system, which didn't even exist yet and wouldn't be founded for another 60 years or a whole lifetime later. So it was pretty stupid for the flat earther to say, Did you know they made up dinosaurs? To people in the school system to uh, perpetuate this six billion year old Earth. Oh, wait, the math doesn't work out. 14 billion year old Earth. No, if we round the numbers out, we could say that it's a 4 billion year old Earth in a 14 billion year old universe. And Lord Kelvin, the physicist who not only had a unit of measure named after him, but also worked out the laws of thermodynamics, was a self-professed intelligent design proponent who did not like evolutionary theory, but he admitted that it was a valid scientific theory. Now, Kelvin originally calculated that according to thermodynamics, the Earth had to be at least 20 million years old. And then he found out about radioactivity in the bowels of the Earth, creating even more heat, and that pushed his estimates back much further. Otherwise, there was nothing wrong with the math, and dinosaurs didn't have anything to do with calculating the age of the Earth. Neither of the scientists I just mentioned accepted evolution anyway. So it, everything this flat earther just said is wrong. But then he's a flat earther, so you've got to expect that everything he says is going to be wrong. The more I researched it, and then I found out that it's actually the, the biblical cosmology is a geocentric cosmology. Then I realized why they're hiding the truth. It's because they don't want anyone to know anything. They want people dumb, blind, deaf to the truth, so they can inject you with their vaccines and their public schooling and this heliocentric model, which is basically for sun worship. If you can't come up with a defensible model, one that you can show actually works, then you don't have anything to begin with, literally, because that is the very first thing that you need. You need more than just ignorance and denial. Unfortunately, just as we can go to Antarctica now, soon there will be space tourism too, very soon, like within a decade. 
regular people like this clown will be able to see Earth from orbit, and then all this flat Earth nonsense will retreat back to the obscurity of paranoid fantasies whence it came. So there's no reason to platform any of these mouth-breathing morons anymore, not even just for the fun of it. This anti-vax, anti-science, anti-intellectualism, religious extremist reality denial is just a symptom of a bigger problem. For the last many years, there's been a terrible confluence of movements, both from the administrative level and from the grassroots level, working toward the dumbing down of America. It's time that we realize that stupidity is not a superpower. If some moron doesn't have any idea what they're talking about because they don't, won't, or can't comprehend anything, then they're not worthy of debate. They should be educated, not debated, unless they don't even care what the truth is, like this guy, like most flat earthers, in which case they should just be ignored. <laughs>